Ever thought your job was tough? Try being an assassin in ancient times, where a bad day at work didn't mean missing a deadline, but possibly missing your head. From the shadowy alleys of medieval cities to the grand halls of empires, assassins have always had a stab at changing history. And no, they weren't just lurking in corners wearing cool hoods. These were the real deal. The sneaky, the brave, and sometimes the downright unlucky. So sharpen your blades, or just your sense of humor, as we dive into the deadly world of the deadliest assassins throughout history. Spoiler alert, it's going to be killer, when killing was a career choice. In the grand, often grim web of history, there's a special thread for those who made a living out of, well, ending lives. Assassins. The word might conjure images of cloaked figures and whispered secrets, but the reality was often more complex and, dare we say, more interesting. Let's set the scene. It's ancient times, and you're looking for a career change. Farming? Too mundane? Soldiering? Too risky? How about assassination? It's got a certain… edge to it. Assassins throughout history weren't just random thugs. They were often highly trained, incredibly skilled, and, in some cases, ideologically driven. It was a profession that required a particular set of skills, skills they acquired over a very interesting career. The job description, be sneaky, be silent, and most importantly, be successful. Failure in this line of work often meant a gruesome end, either at the hands of your target's guards or your employer's displeasure. And let's not forget the moral ambiguity of the whole killing for hire thing. It wasn't a job for the faint-hearted or the heavily conscience-laden, but who were these shadowy figures? Well, they came from all walks of life. Some were lone wolves, the freelancers of the assassination world. Others were part of organized groups like the infamous Hashashin of the Middle East or the ninja clans of Japan. These groups often had their own training methods, codes, and sometimes even a political agenda. The tools of the trade were as varied as the assassins themselves. Daggers, poisons, hidden blades. If it could be used to discreetly eliminate someone, it was in their arsenal. And it wasn't just about brute force. Subtlety and cunning were often their most potent weapons. After all, what's the point of being an assassin if everyone sees you coming? But being an assassin wasn't all about lurking in shadows and whispering ominously. It was a risky business. Apart from the obvious occupational hazards, like getting caught, there was the constant need to stay one step ahead of both the law and the competition. And in a time before LinkedIn, networking was a bit more… complicated. The life of an assassin in history was a blend of skill, danger, and intrigue. It was a career choice that required not just the ability to take a life, but also the smarts to stay alive. So, the next time you complain about your job, just remember, at least you don't have to dodge guards and escape through secret tunnels. Well, hopefully. The Hashishin, not just a cool name. If you thought your office politics were cutthroat, let's take a trip back to the medieval Middle East, where the Hashashin, the original assassins, were turning political intrigue into an art form. These guys weren't just about flashy kills. They were the chess players of the assassination world, and their game board was the sprawling landscape of the Middle East. The Hashashin, or assassins as they came to be known, were a mysterious group. They were like the secret agents of the medieval world, but instead of tuxedos and martinis, they had robes and, well, probably still some kind of medieval martini. Their base? The formidable fortress of Alamut in what is now Iran, which wasn't exactly the kind of place you could just waltz into. Think less open plan office and more impenetrable mountain stronghold. Their modus operandi was the stuff of legends. The Hashishin were known for their precision, patience, and psychological warfare. They didn't just go in swords blazing. They planned their moves meticulously, often infiltrating enemy ranks and biding their time before striking. And when they did strike, it was swift, silent, and, let's be honest, pretty terrifying for the poor guy on the receiving end. But here's where it gets interesting. The Hashashin weren't just mindless killers. They had a cause. They were part of a sect of Shia Islam, and their assassinations were often politically motivated. They were fighting for influence, power, and in their view, the greater good. It's like they were playing a game of risk, but with actual risks. Now you might be wondering about the whole Hashish part of their name. Legend has it that they used the drug to indoctrinate their members, but modern historians are like, eh, 
maybe not. It's more likely that their enemies cooked up these stories to discredit them. After all, nothing says bad PR like being accused of drugging your soldiers. The Hashishin left a lasting impression on the world, and not just because they were the OG assassins. They showed that a small group with enough determination and strategic smarts could influence the course of empires. They were the underdogs of their time, taking on much larger foes with nothing but their wits and some very sharp daggers. Miyamoto Musashi, the Lone Samurai. Let's slice our way into Japan's Edo period, where Miyamoto Musashi, a samurai of legendary status, was making a name for himself, not just in swordsmanship, but also in the fine art of not dying in duels. Musashi wasn't your average samurai. He was more like the action hero of ancient Japan, with a resume that would make even the bravest warriors raise an eyebrow. Musashi's claim to fame? He reportedly participated in over 60 duels and walked away from each one with his head still firmly attached to his shoulders. His first duel? At the tender age of 13. Yes, while most of us were navigating the awkwardness of adolescence, Musashi was out there winning sword fights. Talk about an overachiever. But Musashi wasn't just swinging his sword willy-nilly. He was a strategist, a philosopher, and an artist. He even wrote The Book of Five Rings, which wasn't a fantasy novel but a treatise on strategy, tactics, and philosophy. It's like if Sun Tzu met Leonardo da Vinci, but with more sword fighting. One of Musashi's most famous duels was against Sasaki Kojiro, another renowned swordsman known for his swallow-cut technique. The duel took place on a remote island, which is already pretty dramatic. Musashi, ever the showman, arrived late, carved himself a wooden sword while en route, and then won the duel. Talk about making an entrance and an exit. But Musashi's life wasn't all about dueling. He was also an accomplished artist, sculptor, and calligrapher. Yes, when he wasn't busy being a one-man army, he was getting in touch with his artistic side. It's like he was trying to balance his karma by creating beautiful things after all that dueling. In his later years, Musashi retired from his warrior ways and lived a life of contemplation and artistic pursuit. He became a sort of philosopher-warrior artist, a renaissance man before the renaissance was even a thing. Miyamoto Musashi's life was like a blockbuster movie, filled with epic battles, deep wisdom, and a touch of artistic flair. He was the samurai who had it all, brains, brawn, and a brush. So, the next time you think you're good at multitasking, just remember Musashi. He was out there winning duels and painting masterpieces, probably at the same time. The Dagger in the Dark, Julius Caesar's untimely end. Now let's time travel to ancient Rome, where political drama and backstabbing were more than just metaphors. Enter Julius Caesar, a man who climbed the Roman political ladder faster than you can say, Veni, Vidi, Vici. But as he was about to find out, being at the top meant you were also at the bottom of a lot of hit lists. Caesar, known for his military genius and political savvy, made quite a few enemies on his way up. And we're not talking about the kind of enemies who unfriend you on Facebook. We're talking about the kind who plot your dramatic demise in the Senate. Spoiler alert, things didn't end well for old Julius. The date was March 15th, 44 BC, a day that would later be known as the Ides of March and forever make people wary of mid-March. Caesar, possibly feeling a bit too secure in his power, ignored warnings of a plot against him. He strolled into the Senate like he owned the place, which in a way he kind of did. But waiting for him were a group of senators with something other than political debate on their minds. Led by Brutus and Cassius, these disgruntled politicians decided that the only way to deal with Caesar was the old-fashioned way, a good old stabbing. What followed was less a dignified assassination and more a chaotic frenzy. Caesar, surrounded by senators, was stabbed 23 times. Talk about overkill. And in a twist of dramatic irony, one of his attackers was Brutus, a man Caesar trusted. Et tu, Brut? Indeed. Caesar's assassination wasn't just a personal tragedy, it was a pivotal moment in Roman history. It marked the end of the Roman Republic and paved the way for the Roman Empire. So, in a way, Caesar's death gave birth to a whole new era, which is a pretty impressive posthumous achievement. But let's not forget the assassins. These guys thought they were saving the Republic by getting rid of Caesar. Instead, they ended up accelerating its demise, 
It's like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. Good intentions, disastrous results. In the end, Julius Caesar's assassination was a messy affair that changed the course of history. It's a tale of power, betrayal, and the dangers of ignoring the office gossip. So next time you're warned about the Ides of March, maybe just call in sick. Jing K. A single attempt to change China. Let's venture to ancient China, where Jing K, an assassin with a mission, tried to do the impossible. Take down a king. The target? None other than Ying Zheng, the king of Qin, who was on a fast track to becoming the first emperor of China. No pressure, Jing K. Jing K wasn't your typical assassin. He was more of a scholar and a poet, which in ancient China, apparently, were great prerequisites for becoming an assassin. Who knew? His weapon of choice for this high-stakes mission wasn't a flashy sword or a deadly poison, but something a bit more… creative. The plan was simple, yet audacious. Jing Ke would present a gift to the king. A map. Because who doesn't love maps, right? Hidden in this map was a dagger, the ultimate surprise in a surprise party no one wanted to attend. Accompanying Jing Ke was Qin Wu Yang, another assassin, because sometimes even assassins need a buddy. The day of the assassination attempt arrived. Jing K, map and hidden dagger in hand, approached the king. Tensions were high, palms were sweaty, and not just because it was a hot day. Jing K unfurled the map, reached for the dagger, and, well, let's just say, things didn't go as planned. The king, not one to be easily fooled, dodged the attack. A dramatic struggle ensued, the keen that would make for a great action movie scene. Jing Kei, realizing his plan was unraveling faster than a cheap sweater, made a desperate lunge at the king. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. In the end, Jing Kei's assassination attempt failed, and he met a rather grisly end. But he did manage to leave a mark, quite literally, as he did wound the king. As for Ying Zheng, he went on to become Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China, unifying the country and building a legacy that would last millennia. So, close, but no cigar. Jing Ke. Jing Ke's assassination attempt is one of those moments in history that's a mix of bravery, desperation, and a touch of the dramatic. It's a story that shows how one man's bold, albeit ill-fated action, can ripple through history. And it also teaches us a valuable lesson. If you're going to assassinate a king, maybe don't rely on a map to hide your weapon just a thought. Charlotte Corday, the Angel of Assassination. Fast forward to the French Revolution, a time when guillotines were more popular than baguettes. In this tumultuous era, we meet Charlotte Corday, a young woman who decided to take matters into her own hands, quite literally. Her target? Jean-Paul Marat, a radical journalist and politician whose bathtub meetings were making waves, and not the relaxing kind. Charlotte Corday wasn't your typical assassin. She was more of a girl next door if the girl next door was into stabbing controversial political figures. Her weapon of choice? A simple kitchen knife. Because who needs fancy assassin gadgets when you've got cutlery? Corday's plan was straightforward. Get an audience with Marat under the pretense of providing him a list of enemies. And then, well, let the knife do the talking. Marat, famous for his fiery writings and radical views, was a key figure in the Reign of Terror. He was known for his work in his bathtub due to a skin condition, proving that multitasking can be taken to extreme levels. On July 13, 1793, Corday gained entry to Marat's home. There he was, in his bathtub office, probably not expecting his day to take a sharp turn. Corday presented her list, and then, in a moment that would shock the nation, she plunged her knife into Marat, turning his bathwater into a rather morbid bath bomb. The aftermath was as dramatic as the act itself. Corday was arrested, tried, and in true French Revolution style, introduced to Madame Guillotine. Her last words? Something along the lines of, I killed one man to save a hundred thousand. Talk about being dramatic till the end. Charlotte Corday's assassination of Marat didn't stop the reign of terror, but it did earn her a place in history as a symbol of resistance. It also showed that in times of turmoil, even the most unlikely individuals could take center stage in the theater of revolution. So the next time you're taking a bath and someone knocks on the door, maybe just ask who it is first. You know, just in case. The American Duel, 
Hamilton vs. Burr Let's cross the Atlantic to early 19th century America, where political disagreements weren't just settled in debates, but sometimes on the dueling ground. Enter Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, two prominent figures whose rivalry would lead to one of the most famous duels in American history. It's like a political drama, but with more pistols and less filibustering. Hamilton, a founding father and the first Secretary of the Treasury, was known for his sharp tongue and sharper pen. Burr, the vice president under Thomas Jefferson, was no less ambitious and equally adept at the art of political maneuvering. These two were like the political frenemies of their day, always at odds, always ready with a witty retort. The tension between them had been brewing for years, few led by political clashes and <clears throat> personal slights. It all came to a heed when Hamilton's less than flattering comments about Burr made their way into the press. Burr, not one to take things lying down, challenged Hamilton to a duel. Because nothing says, I disagree with you, like challenging someone to a potentially lethal showdown. The date was July 11, 1804. The place, Weehawken, New Jersey. The event, a duel that would go down in history. Hamilton and Burr, accompanied by their seconds, faced off with the Hudson River as their backdrop. The rules were simple. Stand back to back, walk 10 paces, turn, and fire. It was like a deadly dance, but with less rhythm and more potential for tragedy. Hamilton, who had been involved in several duels but never actually fired a shot, had declared he would throw away his shot. Yes, like the song. Burr, on the other hand, had no such intentions. When the moment came, Hamilton aimed his pistol skyward, but Burr aimed true. Hamilton was hit, and the rest, as they say, is history. The duel had lasting consequences. Hamilton died from his wound, and Burr's political career took a nosedive. Dueling, already frowned upon, became even more so. It was a stark reminder that sometimes, politics can be more than just a battle of words. The Ninja, Shadows of Feudal Japan Now let's ninja roll into Feudal Japan, where the ninja, also known as Shinobi, were mastering the art of being unseen, unheard, and unexpectedly efficient in their jobs. Forget the black pajamas and throwing stars of pop culture. Real ninjas were all about stealth, espionage, and not leaving a trace, except, of course, for the occasional bewildered enemy. Ninjas weren't your typical soldiers. They were the special ops of their day. Operating in the shadows of Japan's Warring States period, these elusive figures were part spy, part guerrilla warrior, and full-time masters of disguise. They could be disguised as farmers by day, only to sneak into an enemy castle by night. It's like being a medieval James Bond, but with less fancy gadgets and more rice farming. Their missions varied from reconnaissance to sabotage, and yes, sometimes assassination. The Ninja Toolkit was a fascinating array of gadgets and weapons, from grappling hooks and smoke bombs to the iconic shuriken or throwing stars. But their most powerful weapon was their cunning and their ability to blend in. They were the original masters of hide and seek, except losing meant a lot more than just a bruised ego. One of the most famous ninja groups was the Iga and Koga clans, who turned their mountainous homelands into ninja strongholds. These areas were like the ninja versions of Ivy League schools, if Ivy League schools taught you how to silently climb walls and read secret messages. But being a ninja wasn't all about sneaking around and throwing sharp objects. It was a tough job. Training was rigorous, often starting from childhood, and involved mastering not just combat, but also survival skills, medicine, and even explosives. It's like the most intense scout troop you could imagine. The role of ninjas in feudal Japan was significant. They were the eyes and ears of their employers, gathering intelligence that could turn the tide of battles. In a time where a samurai's honor was his life, ninjas played by a different set of rules which made them both feared and respected. The World War I Catalyst The Assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand Buckle up for a trip to Sarajevo in 1914 where a wrong turn and a sandwich led to one of the most significant assassinations in history. The victim? Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. The assassin? Gavrilo Princip, a man whose aim was a lot better than his life choices. Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was not exactly Mr. Popular in Serbia. The tensions were high, the political atmosphere was charged, and the Archduke's visit to Sarajevo was like bringing a torch to a fireworks factory. 
Enter the Black Hand, a secret society with a dramatic name and even more dramatic goals, one of which was to get rid of Franz Ferdinand. The assassination plan was like something out of a heist movie, except everything that could go wrong, did. The first attempt on the Archduke's life failed miserably when a grenade missed his car, but fate, and perhaps a bit of bad luck, brought Franz Ferdinand and Gavrilo Princip together outside a sandwich shop. Yes, a sandwich shop. Because sometimes history is not only written by the victors, but also by small eateries. Princip, who probably couldn't believe his luck, took his chance and shot the Archduke and his wife, Sophie. This was not just a tragedy, it was the spark that ignited World War I. It's like accidentally knocking over a domino and watching as it sets off a chain reaction that topples empires. The assassination led to a web of alliances being activated, countries declaring war on each other, and before you knew it, the world was embroiled in one of the deadliest conflicts in history. All because of a sandwich shop encounter. It makes you think twice about where you eat your lunch. Gavrilo Princip, the man behind the trigger, became a figure of infamy. His actions had consequences far beyond what he could have imagined. It's a stark reminder that sometimes, small actions can have huge repercussions, especially if those actions involve shooting archdukes. Modern Shadows Assassins in the 20th Century As we leap into the 20th century, the world of assassination gets a modern makeover. Gone are the days of swords and daggers. Welcome to the era of sniper rifles, cyanide pills, and for the particularly unlucky, exploding cigars. Yes, the life of a modern assassin could be straight out of a spy thriller, minus the glamorous locations and fancy cocktails. First up, let's talk about the Cold War, a time when the world was a chessboard and spies were the pawns. Assassins during this period were more likely to be wearing a suit and tie than a ninja outfit. They were the shadowy figures lurking behind geopolitical dramas, armed with an array of gadgets that would make Q from James Bond green with envy. One of the most notorious assassins of this era was the infamous Carlos the Jackal. With a nickname that sounds like a villain from a comic book, Carlos was a Marxist militant who turned the art of assassination into headline news. His methods were as bold as they were brutal, and he had a knack for evading capture, making him a sort of celebrity in the underworld of espionage. But it wasn't all about lone wolves like Carlos. State-sponsored assassination was a real and present danger. Governments, not wanting to get their hands dirty, outsourced their dirty work to professionals. These assassins were the real deal, trained in everything from covert surveillance to making a lethal weapon out of everyday items. Ever looked suspiciously at a pen after huh? watching a spy movie? You can thank these guys. The 20th century also saw its fair share of political assassinations. Figures like John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and Mahatma Gandhi were all victims of assassins' bullets. These weren't just crimes, they were events that shaped the course of history, proving that the pen might be mightier than the sword, but a gun was still pretty effective. But let's not forget the failed attempts, which sometimes were as bizarre as they were unsuccessful. Fidel Castro, the longtime leader of Cuba, reportedly survived over 600 assassination attempts. These included exploding cigars, poisoned wetsuits, and even a fungal-infected scuba diving suit. It's like while E. Coyote was in charge of the assassination plans. In the world of modern assassins, the stakes were high, the methods were varied, and the consequences were often global. It was a world where the line between right and wrong was blurred, and the only rule was to not get caught. So the next time you're watching a spy movie and think, that can't be real, just remember, reality is often stranger than fiction.